Hello and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on our playlist, Deadly Destinations, where we visit the sites of terrible events. Sometimes they're murders, sometimes they're tragedies, sometimes they're mass murders. Today I'm coming to you from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where in 2005, a madman committed an unspeakable act. I'm gonna show you around the area, we're gonna take a little tour of the town, we're gonna to discuss his crimes, and then we're gonna to go to the location that's a restaurant that's associated with the crime. I'm Stacy Lee, let's begin. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is a gorgeous, picturesque mountain town in Northern Idaho. There are about 55,000 people in the area, which is known for the beautiful lake of the same name that sits just outside of town where visitors can boat, fish, kayak, parasail, cruise the lake, and camp. If you were to look up a photo of beautiful mountain town, it would look just like Coeur d'Alene. There are towering pine trees, beautiful old buildings and churches with wonderful histories, long-standing traditions, and hardworking people. There are fabulous parks, a museum, lots of festivals and street fairs, and Coeur d'Alene is a town that likes to party. Today there is a mac and cheese festival downtown where people can buy a wristband and wander from restaurant to restaurant tasting a different version of mac and cheese at each stop. We had a fantastic meal of oysters and poutine here at Crickets, which sits right in the heart of downtown Coeur d'Alene. There is sidewalk seating in front, seating inside, and a beautiful outdoor patio where you can take in some sun on a day like today. You can visit Post Falls Park about 10 miles from town or Treaty Rock Park. You can also go rock climbing at Camelin Park right alongside the Spokane River. Coeur d'Alene is a big town for biking and there are lots of beautiful and scenic trails and places to rent bikes if you don't have your own. There is a fantastic resort right in the center of town which is home to a luxury hotel, marina, convention center and several restaurants. If you're an outdoors person who doesn't mind the cold weather, you could easily fall in love with Coeur d'Alene. There is a laid back vibe where friendly people live in relative peace and enjoy their beautiful surroundings. But in May of 2005, a terrible and evil man brought murder to this tranquil place. And it wasn't just murder, it was multiple murder, child abuse and kidnapping. Driving along this beautiful lake in this breathtaking scenery, it's difficult to imagine what happened here. But just up this road, in this gorgeous mountain valley suburb called Wolf Lodge Bay, an unspeakable crime was committed in the dead of night that would change Coeur d'Alene and many lives forever. The people living inside a little white cinder block house right here on this mountain had no idea they were being stalked by a madman who was watching them from the forest. No one knew or could have known, but when a neighbor went over to the house to pay one of the boys that lived there for mowing his lawn, and no one answered the door, and then that neighbor saw blood on the porch, everyone soon found out. On the evening of May 16, 2005, investigator Brad Maskell got a call at home from two Coeur d'Alene officers who had entered the little white house and discovered a massacre. There were three people dead inside, the house interior was covered in blood, and two children were missing. 40-year-old Brenda Grone was lying face down in a pool of blood inside the kitchen. Her 13-year-old son Slade was next to her. In the living room, police found Brenda's boyfriend and the owner of the home, Mark McKenzie, who had also been killed. The three had been bound, beaten to death with a framing hammer, and had also been shot. By 11 o'clock that night, a warrant had been issued to search the residence and the vehicles along with computer, phone, and cell phone records. Inside a 1988 Ford pickup found on the neighbor's property, police found a new roll of duct tape along with wadded up duct tape and zip ties. After an extensive search of the property, the sickening realization set in that the younger children, Dylan Grown, age nine, and Shasta Grown, age eight, were gone. An Amber Alert was issued for the missing children and the search began. What also began was weeks and weeks of pure hell for little Shasta and Dylan. They had been taken from the home by a stranger, a madman child molester and murderer who had just killed their family. 
Investigators were brought in from Boise to work the crime scene and local police went on high alert, working up to 17 hours a day looking for the children. The children's biological father was questioned and ruled out. Neighbors and friends were questioned and ruled out. The days and then weeks and then a month went by and then it happened. On July 2, 2005, a waitress, Amber Dean, at this Denny's restaurant noticed a man and a little girl eating at a table in the dining room. The waitress recognized the little girl from missing posters and knew that she was Shasta Grown. She called the police and then stalled the man by giving Shasta crayons and going over each and every dessert option as she nervously awaited for police to arrive. When they did, they entered the Denny's and took this man, Joseph Edward Duncan III, a known and convicted child molester, into custody. As they handcuffed him, the waitress bent down and asked the little girl her name. She replied, Shasta groaned, and then burst into tears. Shasta had been rescued, but her brother Dylan was not with her. Both Shasta and her captor Duncan were taken to police headquarters. Duncan was questioned by investigator Maskell, who said Duncan was tired, articulate, and intelligent. But then Maskell saw photos and videos that Duncan had taken of and with the children, photos and videos that have never been released. Maskell later said, When I was sitting across the table from him, I sometimes felt as though I was literally talking to the devil. He had no emotion or remorse whatsoever. In another room, Shasta began detailing the unbelievably horrific crimes she and her brother had endured. Details that have been redacted from public records and details that I would not go into even if they hadn't been. Shasta wasn't sure exactly when, but she knew that at one of the many campsites the three had stayed at, her brother had been murdered. She witnessed his murder. Duncan told police it had been an accident, that he had been reaching for a beer in the cooler when a shotgun leaning on the truck tipped over and went off, shooting Dylan in the stomach. She said that after it happened, Duncan told her he had only shot Dylan in the head to put him out of his misery after the accident. The body of Dylan Grone was later recovered at a Montana campsite. Shasta was examined at a local hospital and was then reunited with her father, Steve Grone, and her older brother, Vance. Joseph Edward Duncan, this piece of human garbage, confessed to the murders of Mark, Brenda, and Slade, was put on trial for them, and was then tried in federal court in Boise for the kidnappings and murder of Dylan. Duncan had a record of sex offenses dating back to 1980 and had just been released on bail in Minnesota weeks before these crimes. I think we can all agree that we have got to do better at keeping these types of people locked up and we have got to do better at keeping the public protected from these monsters. At the trial, it was revealed that much of what was known about the murders was revealed by Shasta, who said that awful night she was called to the living room by her mother, where she saw Duncan holding a gun. He then bound Brenda, Mark, and Slade's hands with zip ties. She said Duncan then took she and Dylan to his stolen rental car, and as she sat in the car with her brother, she heard Mark scream and then saw Slade, injured, staggering on the front porch. She reported that the trio then left the home and traveled a long time to and from different campsites where Duncan would often tell the children about what he had done to their family. She also reported that Duncan tried to kill her once, but when she started crying, he changed his mind. In Idaho, Duncan was convicted and sentenced to die. He was also tried and convicted of the kidnapping and murder of Anthony Martinez in an entirely separate trial. The Idaho jury members were offered counseling after the trial to help them deal with the evidence and videos they were forced to watch during the proceedings. Duncan was sent to federal prison, and in October 2020, he underwent brain surgery after he was diagnosed with glioblastoma. He declined chemotherapy and radiation, and he died from his disease on March 28, 2021, at the age of 58. Shasta Grone released a statement upon his death saying, quote, One thing is for sure, he does not exist anymore. 
Now we can live our lives knowing that. For so long I have been struggling with hate towards that man. Today I woke up feeling like my soul was finally free. I'm happy that Shasta feels that way and I have no problem in stating the world is a better place now that he's gone. We need a little respite from the details of this terrible case. As we always do here on Dining with Death, we discuss the element of food associated with the case we cover. Food and crime and death are often closely related. Food and death are also two things we all have in common, and those ties are the ones that we discuss on this channel. This is the Denny's that is forever tied to this tragic case and the place where, thankfully, a caring woman who was paying attention helped bring it to a close. Denny's is known for its 24-hour diner style food. I have personally spent countless late nights slash early mornings here after performing shows as a singer and musician. The food is traditional American diner food. They have things like steak and eggs, burgers, omelets, pancakes, and my favorite, moons over my hammy, which is what I ordered. I first ordered this dish because of the name, which is a play on the title Moon Over Miami, the very famous film starring Betty Grable from 1941. But after I first ordered it, it became my go-to. It's a ham and scrambled egg sandwich with Swiss cheese, all served on grilled sourdough bread. It comes with Denny's hash browns and always hits the spot at about 3 a.m. after a three-hour show and an hour of loading gear. Denny's is an American tradition and is a place you know you can always get some solid chow no matter what time of day or night it is. This Denny's, unfortunately, will always be tied to the terrible and tragic case of the Coeur d'Alene murders and kidnappings. We want to wish Shasta and her family well. Cases like this are part of the reason we started this channel. Discussing the crimes, remembering the victims, and keeping the conversation going as to how to prevent horrific events like this in the future, that matters. It matters to us, and we know it matters to you. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Deadly Destinations. We sure appreciate your support. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Stay safe and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death.